The Federal High Court sitting in Abuja on Wednesday declined to grant bail to the detained leader of the indigenous people of Biafra, IPOP, Namdekanu. Pending the de determination of the treasonable felony charge, the federal government preferred against him. Trial Justice Binta Iaku held that Kanu must explain the reason why he breached the previous bail that was given to him before he could enjoy another favorable decision from the court. With us to discuss this issue in the light of recent development is Mr. Bruce Fain, an international counsel and spokesperson for Namdekano, leader of the indigenous people of Biafra. We are delighted to have you once again here on Sahara TV, Mr. Bruce Fain. Well, thank you for inviting me. Let's jump right into this. Would you consider the recent ruling by the Federal High Court in Nigeria denying Namdekano's bail application as an, as an other setback? Uh, perhaps that's a bit too strong. Um, she did not, uh, Justice uh, Binta Nayaku didn't deny the bail uh, outright, simply said, I want a hearing to explain the disappearance of September 2017. Nevertheless, I believe that uh, Justice uh, Binta Nayaku was disingenuous. I mean, it's notorious uh, that in September of 2017, the federal government of Nigeria attempted to assassinate Namdi Khan. Uh, he was in his home. They fired bullets are there. Many, many people were killed and he had to flee under duress. He has a he has an inherent human right to live and to avoid uh, being killed. Uh, not only that, um, before this hearing, uh, the Abia High Court had made a specific ruling that Namdi Kana was entitled to $5 billion in Naira, payable by the federal government of Nigeria for the attempted assassination and other human rights violations against him in September 2017. So we already have an adjudication confirming that Namdi Kana did not flee uh, any sense voluntarily. In the law, it's called he fled under duress. Uh, anyone else would, it wasn't a voluntary choice. Uh, in the sense that he had an option other than agreeing to die uh, if he didn't flee. And that excuses um, the flight under the eye, in the eyes of the law. And in my judgment, um, and I, this is a fact so notorious that it's hard to imagine that someone who's as learned as uh, Binta Nyaku wouldn't know that. Uh, so in some sense, she kind of pushed the issue down the road. She didn't say no. Uh, and I do believe at the next hearing, uh, we will hear a full explanation of the Abia High Court's decision, how a, a colleague of hers, a judge, has already found that the government attempted to assassinate uh, Namdi Kanu, and that was why he had to flee. Uh, and that means that he would not be a risk of flight if they granted bail now, because his earlier flight was not voluntary, it wasn't evasive, it's self-preservation. Uh, the hearing yesterday did not go without another legal shenanigans by the federal government prosecuting council as they attempted to dump another uh, new amended charges in the court. Uh, Justice Yako went ahead to strike out the charges prevailed against uh, Namdi Kanu. Uh, what's your reaction to this? Well, I think the this is now the third time that the government has amended their charges. And remember, we are now at 11 months yeah. since the government detained Namdi Kanu. Um, and they have limitless resources uh, to investigate and prosecute the case uh, and to continue to amend the charges. And remember, these amendments come after the government has certified in their previous filings that the investigation is finished and concluded. Then if it's concluded and finished, why do you keep adding charges? There's no new information there. So we know, I think, to a reasonable certainty this is an effort to delay for the sake of delay. It's my judgment as a lawyer, having examined the infinite vagueness of the charges, uh, that there is no evidence of guilt and that they are frightened to death of having to go to trial. That's in one other element of yesterday's hearing that I think is important to note. You recall um, Chief Judge Tosho uh, previously had authorized secret trial of Nandi Khan. Uh, no one asked him for that, and it's clearly it was orchestrated by the government. In my view, it's because they know that an open trial would make a farce of what the government is trying to prove. But yesterday's hearing was open. Now, after that, after the Chief Judge Tosho issued his order, I had filed 
a complaint with the International Criminal Court yeah. saying this is another, this is part of the crime against humanity and this entire attempted judicial murder of Namdi Kanu. So it looks to me like they backed off because this was open. You could see TV in the courtroom. So I would hope that they're getting a little bit of sense in them, uh, that this trial is going to end up hurting them a lot more than it's going to hurt the Biafran quest uh, because it's such a symbolic um, demonstration of the viciousness and the lawlessness of the Nigerian government. But why your your view and opinion? Why is the Prosecution Council uh, trying to delay process by continuous amendment of the charges against uh, your client? Uh, is this um, to further put him under in consideration until the end of this uh, government life of this? Uh, well, yeah, I, I think there I think there are at least two ulterior motives, um, and oftentimes there are you know multiple reasons for a single action. One is that it's a mess. The government has nothing. They want to hand it off to the next government after the presidential elections in 2023. So just keep kicking it down the road. It's their problem, not ours. Uh, the second is more vicious, and they just might hope because Namdi Kanu's health is not A plus, and they're not, and they're depriving him of access to international uh, medical care of the highest standards. They hope, well, maybe he'll just die, uh, and that'll get off his plate. But it is clear they do not want a trial. This government would stoop to anything to try to besmirch, uh, defame Namdi Kanu's reputation. If they had incriminating evidence, they would have leaked it out to all the press in the whole world. That's true. You know, they, they don't have any respect for any standards whatsoever. And what we've gotten is zero. They have submitted to the court not a crumb of incriminating evidence against Namdi Kanu. And even the allegations and the charges are infinitely vague. For example, they'll say something like a broadcast sometime during 2018, 2021. Now, that's three years. They can't even identify an approximate date. They don't even identify the words, the transcript that said Namdi uttered X, Y, Z that incited people to do things. It's just all made up out of thin air. Can you imagine charging someone with treason and it happened sometime within a three year interlude and you don't know when <laughs> i mean it must have been pretty light treason if you can't find it in three years it's quite pathetic um you actually took uh to write in the uh, 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 a scattered uh, remark against this uh, government uh, when you actually ask uh, facebook uh, to ban the buhari's government for engaging in genocide and crimes against Biafran or others considering uh, the actions of this government in present time why why, why would you do that sir well, the reason is that's what they deserve, in my judgment. Facebook standards say they're not supposed to offer its platform, you know, to promote criminal activity. Uh, the government of Nigeria, at least with regard to Biafras, virtually everything they say is calculated to advance their effort to exterminate the Biafran people, whether it's rape or starvation or murder or plunder or one or the other. That's the policy of this government against Biafrans. And this government views as criminal the exercise of the Biafran right to seek self-determination. That right is not made up. It's enshrined in Article 1 of the International Covenant of Civil Political Rights signed by 172 nations, including Nigeria. It's there and you're bound by it. Nigerian law bounds the government to, and not only that, under international law, they would be bound anyway. Self-determination is an unalienable right. People can't surrender it. Um, and that's why, in my judgment, why are you giving platform to a, really a, a government that's little more than a criminal conspiracy to violate the law? But but let me get your perspective on this. The Nigerian government actually said uh, that the basis for they are asking the platform to stop allowing IPOP to use their platform is because of the they allegedly incite violence and provoke ethnic hatred in the country. I mean, considering the I mean the the, the crimes the crimes are, and the violence taking place in the South at the moment. What's your reaction in response to that? Well, the, the what the what the uh, the uh, minister said was that. Well, in 2017, uh, IPOB was listed as a terrorist organization. Exactly. Well, true enough. Only by Nigeria. What he left out was the fact following. If you, if you examine the proceedings, this is how you get listed as a terrorist organization under Nigerian law. Uh, the president of Nigeria decides 
based upon whatever he believes he wants to decide, you're a terrorist organization. He instructs the attorney general to go to court and say, have the court enter an order that XYZ is a terrorist organization. And the court does it. There's no notice. There's no opportunity to respond. There's no due process whatsoever. This is a complete joke. The president could name you or me. Okay, you're a terrorist. That's the end of the matter. There's no hearing. We can't respond. This was so deficient procedurally that it provoked five human rights experts at the UN Human Rights Council to write Buhari a personal letter in October of 2000 and asked us, I don't see any. They said, we see no evidence that IPOB is a terrorist organization. Please, within 60 days, this is in two, October 2000, submit to us evidence showing IPOB is a terrorist organization. And Buhari snubbed them wouldn't even respond. These are five neutral, they're not Biafrans, neutral human rights experts from the UN Human Rights Council. They asked, they said, we don't see it. You please provide us the evidence. He wouldn't even have the decency and courtesy to respond. That's how they view IPOB or Biafran terrorism. And remember as well, it is not terrorism to defend yourself if you're attacked. If someone is attacking you and is trying to kill you, and you fight back in self-defense, you're not guilty of terrorism. You are completely justified in trying to protect your own life. And what's happening in the Southeast, by and large, sure, <laughs> the Biafrans don't want to die without resistance. And so when they fight back, that's not terrorism. That's self-defense, which is completely legal. When the Jews were being persecuted in the Warsaw Ghetto and they fought back, sure, the Nazis said, oh, this is Jewish terrorism, right? They're trying to live. So that what makes this so Orwellian in their description of what's actually transpiring. And it's a true tragedy in my judgment that so much of this goes under the water because the international community, they're preoccupied with Ukraine or some other thing. Uh, Nigeria has oil and if we're gonna cut off oil from Russia, we're looking for other places where we can get oil to keep prices down. And so this, this kind of information is large, if not 100% suppressed, but it doesn't reach the threshold that we need, in my judgment, at least right now, to get the international pressure to say, this is a genocidal government. It should be ostracized even more than Putin in Russia. Now, let me, let's get a sense, or help us get a sense of this. I mean, the crisis the southeastern part of the country with regards to uh, violence uh, that is orchestrated against uh, the citizens of the southeastern part of the country, uh, in, uh, which has actually been, we've had cases of unknown gunmen that have been destroying properties that uh, sit at home, others by IPOB, and uh, all sorts governments, I mean, uh, actions. And recently, well, one of the governors of the Southeast actually paid a visit to uh, Namdekanu uh, in detention. Uh, and so yet, uh, even after the visit, there's been an uptick in the violence uh, in the Southeast. Uh, is IPOB responsible for all this? <laughs> IPOB is not responsible in any legal sense. I mean, if we think, think about the sit at home, stay at home uh, uh, practices, it's what you might call a boycott as a form of demonstration. That is completely protected. In the United States of America, when I was growing up, the way, one of the most effective ways that the blacks were able to get their civil rights, a very famous Montgomery, Alabama boys, bus boycott. The, the blacks, okay, we're not going to patronize the buses. True. That was constitutionally protected freedom. That is one way in which you are expressing your opposition to something. And you have a free speech right to do that, freedom of association right to do that. Why are you condemning these people for staying at home as a method because they can't vote you out because the, the voting process is corrupted as a method of saying we do not subscribe to your policies. And that is viewed by the government as somehow criminal activity, you know? This is, this, is, this is peaceful protest at its best, at its most civilized. Uh, oh, you, you, yeah. you also tackled the United Kingdom government over its inaction on the Biafran agitation recently. Uh, uh, you asked them, saying uh, that uh, the UK government have been missing in action to support the Biafran agitation. Can you exp explain more of this? One? Yes. Um, the, the right to self-determination, as I say, is, is a, of, of peoples, again, enshrined in many uh, international human rights covenants, including those to which 
Great Britain as a signatory. In fact, if we want to trace the origins of this idea, it's found in the United States um, Declaration of Independence, where it announces all peoples have the right to government by the consent of the governed. That's a different way of saying self-determination. It's the consent of the governed that determines what the government ought to be. Um, and that um, the UK, when they colonized Nigeria, they had, and this is after the UK had signed treaties with Biafra in the 1800s, treaties recognizing that it was a legally cognizable entity, Biafra. Then they amalgamate Biafra with the Aruba, the House of Fulani, others in 1914. They extinguished their nationhood, which they previously recognized through treaties. And then when it comes to 1960, with independence and under decolonization rules, decolonization rules specifically stipulate that all peoples have a right to self-determination. Instead of having self-determination votes in 1960 and then diff diffusing the power that they were exercising and forcing all the Nigerians under one roof based upon the results of self-determination votes, and it could have been a Biafran vote, a Ruba vote, House of Fulani. They just decamped and gave it to a unitary government that was basically its successor to its own illegal uniform government that was never agreed to by a single African vote. And I want to underscore this. When the boundaries of Nigeria were drawn, not one Nigerian in those boundaries voted for it. It was all imposed by whites thousands of miles away. So if that's not injustice, I don't know what is. I'd say, and as an American, I feel strongly, of course, we separated from Great Britain too they were denying us any representation uh, in 1776. Uh, so that is why the UK is missing in action. They ought to be in the forefront urging that Nigeria should be enforcing Article 1, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, hold a referendum under United Nations auspices. Most recently it was done in South Sudan. The South Sudanese voted like 99.9% .9 to secede Unfortunately, the nation has not prospered afterwards, but at least they had the right to self-determination. So we know how to do this. It's not reinventing the wheel. And UK has an obligation as a prominent member of the international community to seek to enforce their own international right of self-determination, especially because Britain itself, it gives Scotland the right to self-determination. They were able to vote whether they wanted to secede. It gave the Northern Ireland a right to decide whether they wanted to be part of UK or Ireland. So the British know how to do this. So when it's the white Anglo-Saxon, they give them the right. Why are Nigerians or Biafrans any less human than the Scotch or the Northern Irish? They aren't. You are also went ahead to, to urge the British royal family to actually visit the Southeast Nigeria and to compensate, and not just compensate, but apologize for abandoning the Igbos to Fulani terrorists in your recent twist. How culpable is the British government as far as this uh, travails is concerned? Well, this is something that ought to happen. I say the, the British apologize, you know, oftentimes the Irish potato famine, they got a lot of apologizing to do. They were involved in the international slave trade, um, divide and conquer. It wasn't just Nigeria that they destroyed a lot of other peoples in, in Africa. Uh, but I do think that um, we do have at least some recognition of the looting and injustice of Africa, initially repatriating some of the cultural artifacts that were stolen uh, and, and, paying, and at least having some uh, type of thought towards reparations. Uh, these things don't happen overnight. Uh, but I think it's something that has to be said. And until the ID is broached, the, the first ID is always a minority of one. Somebody has to stand up and say, hey, this is unjust. It doesn't mean it's going to happen the next day. But that's how all progress is made. Somebody has to call a spade a spade and say, this is unjust and we got to fight against it. Then, it, then you got to rally and, and not give up. And it may take uh, one year or five or ten. But you don't give up. And I don't think there's any question that the UK is complicit in staggering injustices against the Biafrans. So what are the consequential implications that stand out in the uh, recent United Kingdom government statement on the separatist groups in Nigeria, South, uh, Southeast region? Um, your take on this, please. Well, I think it, it, uh, it was largely uh, overstated 
the gist of what uh, the the UK said was not that IPOB is a terrorist, terrorist organization. True. It did not say that. It went out of states and we did not say it. all it said was that on an individual basis, and this is true under the refugee conventions, and we have it in the United States, if the individual applying for refugee status can be shown to be have personally engaged in terrorism or inciting violence, then you can exclude them. But obviously, that means that if you had to resort to violence to protect your life because you're being attacked, that's not terrorist. That's not illegality. It's not murder. It's, it's called the right of self-preservation, which is inherent in every individual who's ever been born on this planet. So I think it was just stating, and perhaps because there has been a surge of violence in the Southeast, in my judgment, largely provoked by the fact that the, uh, the Python dance won to yeah. the, the Fulani out there, they they're continue to, to escalate um, the violence. Uh, that means that had more more requirement to self-defense if you're going to live at all. Now, considering the fact that uh, lawful agitation and um, pursuit of a legitimate cause is actually on, allowed under democracy, uh, the use of violence and the breakdown of law and order uh, nullifies any of such a claim to such a cause. Uh, shouldn't IPOB at this point in time owe themselves and the Nigerian state a duty to de-escalate the tension and violence in the southeast at this point in time? And what's your, uh, what's uh, Namde Kanu's position on take on, the, on this, please? We, I think IPOB Namdi's position has always been legal avenues of redress. Uh, but you can't de-escalate when the other side is escalating the violence other than just letting them slaughter you. That's what the Jews found out with the Nazis. They're supposed to de-escalate in Auschwitz, you know, and Bergen-Belsen and Dachau and the Warsaw Ghetto. Sure, it's easy to de-escalate if the other side isn't attacking you. But if the other side continues to increase the attack, what can you do? You, you ha and they say, everybody has a right to self-defense. And then if someone's trying to kill you, um, you, you would be in some sense culpable if you didn't try to fight back and preserve your life. Uh, you're not the wrongdoer. So this idea of, and they're, they're just of their, their suggestion of, of de-escalation is, well, stop the sit-ins. Well, why? We didn't, we didn't stop the Montgomery bus boycotts. Uh, even in, in the United States today, it's regular. Uh, states will boycott a state. We don't like your abortion laws or whatever. We won't do business to you. But that is a civilized way in which you can express your opposition. It's not picking up a gun, a knife, trying to starve people, trying to use physical threats and violence to intimidate them. It's simply a, re a right recognized under international law and custom and practice uh, to express your view in a very strong way. Okay, don't want to do business with you. I don't want to show up for work today. So, Mr. Bruce Fain, finally, um, what's next uh, for the, as far as this uh, legal uh, battle is concerned? Uh, do you see any light at the end of the tunnel? Well, if we were to, if we were in an ordinary legal system, the answer would be yes, because it looks like there's supposed to be a trial to begin on May 26th. 26, yep. um, but <laughs> you know, listen, I've been there and to see how many dates get changed at the drop of a hat, you know, five hours before something's supposed to start. Um, I think what we do know is this, that the government of Nigeria will respond to pressure but law really has very little to do with what transpires. And so we still, again, with peaceful means, and that's advocacy, strong advocacy, point out the lawlessness and the injustice. Um, and I would hope that they would find it in their best interest for everybody. If you are treating the Biafrans differently, why are you worried about, I mean, decently, why are you worried about a referendum? They'll vote to stay in. I mean, the Scottish voted to stay in with, with the UK, right? They rejected independence. The reason why you're fearing them is because you're oppressing them. If you want them to vote the other way, how about giving them <laughs> the right to govern themselves uh, that they've been denied for a century or more? Uh, so I just think, uh, unlike other legal systems, it's very, very problematic here. I am guardedly optimistic, however, that given the definitiveness of the Abia High Court's ruling that Namdi Kano had to flee in 2017 to escape an assassination attempt by the government and award 5 billion naira in damages. I think that will be influential in uh, in, in, in Justice Bintaniaku's decision on bail, and that would mean 
Namdi Khan was out, he would have access to his lawyers, including me, because I've been denied access to him on five occasions, uh, even though under Nigerian law and international law, he's a right uh, to counsel. Um, so I'm guardedly optimistic that maybe they're kind of getting the message uh, that this is turning into a, um, uh, a crown of thorns uh, for them. Uh, and, 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 but, but say it's, it's guarded uh, because this government is going to act based upon outside pressure, not the inherent just of the situation. Mr. Bruce Fain, the International Council and spokesperson for Namdekano, leader of the indigenous people of Biafra, IPOP. It's always a pleasure having you on Sahara TV. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me. You're a wonderful questioner. Take care, please. Okay. Bye.